on Wednesday, November 8th, 1961, the Dupperalt family, consisting of Arthur, Jean, Brian, Renee, and Terry Joe, boarded the Bluebell, a 60-foot, twin-masted sailing catch that was based out of Fort Lauderdale, Florida. They had chartered the vessel for a dream vacation, sailing around the Florida Keys and over to the Bahamas. For this trip, they had hired a local yachtsman named Julian Harvey to skipper the vessel, and additionally, Harvey's wife, Mary Dean Harvey, was serving as the cook. However, unbeknownst to the Dupperalt family, Julian Harvey had much more sinister ideas for what was to happen during this trip, and due to a series of events, the Dupperalt's dream vacation would swiftly turn into a nightmare from which only one of them would survive. The Bluebell was a catch, a humble little twin-masted sailboat that had first been launched all the way back in 1928. She served in her relatively small role for many years, and by the 1960s was under the ownership of one Harold Pegg. The Dupperalt family were actually from Green Bay, Wisconsin, and Arthur was a successful contact lens optometrist, as well as a World War II veteran. He had actually long dreamed of taking his family on a week-long cruise from the Florida Keys in the Bahamas, not just because of the beautiful area, but also because he had sailed there during his World War II service. He knew how beautiful the location was, and it was a far cry from the cold winters of Wisconsin. Each year, they had put aside money to save for this once-in-a-lifetime vacation, and by the summer of 1961, they had finally saved up enough of it. They planned to spend a whole week living at sea, on board a chartered yacht, and docking at several chosen destinations. They arrived in Fort Lauderdale, Florida in early November of that year, where they opted to charter the Bluebell, which was stationed at Bahia Mar Marina. Arthur was the one who opted to hire Julian Harvey to skipper the vessel, as he was already acquainted with the man, and Harvey was an experienced local yachtsman. He was well known, so he was perfectly qualified for the job. Harvey brought his 34-year-old wife, Mary Dean, along so she could serve as the cook, and it's probably worth mentioning, she was actually his sixth wife. The Dubberalt family boarded the Blue Bell at around midday on Wednesday, November 8th, 1961. At first, however, the trip is known to have been quite good, exactly as the Dupperalts had dreamed it would be. Over the following four days, they traveled to locations like Bimini and Sandy Point, where they wound up purchasing souvenirs and did some snorkeling. On November 12th, at their final port of call prior to returning to Florida, Dupperalt and Captain Harvey actually visited the office of British District Commissioner Roderick Pinder. During their talk, Arthur told Pinder that this had been a once-in-a-lifetime vacation, and will be back before Christmas. That evening, the family enjoyed a delicious meal, and 11-year-old Terry Jo walked below deck to her sleeping cabin, leaving her family and the Harveys up on deck. Over the following week, the exact fate of the ship and those on board would remain a little unclear, as just the following day, November 13th, at 12.35pm, a crew member aboard the oil tanker, Gulf Lion, spotted a man out in the ocean waving frantically from a dinghy that was drifting in their general direction. He was shouting, Help! I have a dead baby on board! Of course, they brought the man on board, and crew members observed the deceased body of a red-haired young girl who was wearing a life jacket inside the dinghy. The man identified himself as Julian Harvey, and he went on to explain that at around 8.30 the previous night, his vessel was hit by a sudden, strong squall that had caused the bluebell to rapidly keel over and the mast to snap at a location between the Abaco Islands and Great Stirrup Cay. This injured his wife and Dupperalt and pierced the ship's hull. Harvey said that he was separated from all the others on board the catch by his falling mass and the loose rigging, which also pulled down the mizzen. He tried to retrieve wire cutters from the cabin to clear the deck space, 
But then a fire broke out on board the small vessel, and he wasn't able to get to anyone to mount a rescue. He was forced to abandon the catch alone on a dinghy, and then the body of Renee floated by. She was only seven years old. He retrieved her body and tried to revive her, but was unsuccessful. He said he chose to keep her in the raft with him out of respect. A later autopsy did reveal that Renee died from drowning. Harvey was taken to NASA, where he was scrutinized by authorities. He was relatively calm, which did arouse a little bit of suspicion, and his dinghy was filled with various survival supplies. Seemingly in preparation for some kind of disaster he already knew was coming, but his story couldn't be disproven at the time. So, he was allowed to return to Miami on November 15th, to face further questioning by the U.S. Coast Guard. However, three days later, on November 16th, a child was rescued in the Northwest Providence Channel by a Greek freighter known as Captain Theo. Interestingly, Captain Theo was also a veteran of World War II. She was originally known as HMS Searcher, a ruler-class escort carrier for the Royal Navy. The second officer of the ship had spotted her floating aboard a two-by-five-foot cork float. He summoned the captain to the bridge, and he proceeded to order the freighter's engines be stopped and a life raft lowered. The crew actually saw sharks circling the cork float, so they had shouted to the girl not to jump into the water, while one of them lifted her aboard the raft. She was then taken aboard Captain Theo and placed in a spare cabin. They tried to converse with her, but at the time, she was rather incoherent and barely able to speak. They gave her water and orange juice as they sponged salt from her body with wet towels, and they applied Vaseline to her lips. She was eventually able to identify herself as 11-year-old Terry Jo Dupperalt. She explained that she'd been at sea for several days. Three and a half, it would eventually be realized. And after giving a limited explanation, she wound up passing out, as she was understandably completely exhausted. The crew of the Captain Theo immediately informed the U.S. Coast Guard of their discovery, as well as Terry Joe's concerning medical situation. A rescue helicopter was summoned, and Terry Joe was taken to hospital in critical condition. She was dealing with severe sunburn, dehydration, as well as just general exposure. Three hours after arriving at a Miami hospital, Terry Jo did start to bounce back, slowly but surely. But for two days, she couldn't actually divulge to police or the Coast Guard exactly the circumstances surrounding her rescue or the truth of what had actually happened to her family, as well as Mary Dean Harvey. While all this was going on, Julian Harvey had reiterated his story to the U.S. Coast Guard on November 16th. But the following day, on the 17th, Midway through another scheduled interrogation, Harvey was told that Terry Jo had been rescued and that her condition was improving. His initial response was to shout, Oh my God! Before quickly and calmly adding, Isn't that wonderful? Yes, that's wonderful. So wonderful. A lieutenant then told Harvey that an official investigation into the loss of the Bluebell as well as her passengers, was to be launched that very day. And right after he was told that, Harvey asked to be excused from further interrogation, claiming that he was just so very, very tired, and that he wished to talk to his wife's family. They decided to grant his request. Harvey then drove to a nearby motel, where he checked in under an assumed name, John Monroe, and he paid cash for a room. Then he penned a two-page note before offing himself. His body was found by a maid two hours later. In the note, which was addressed to a close friend, he offered no explanations or apologies for his actions and simply ended with the words, I got too tired and nervous, I couldn't stand it any longer. Harvey also requested that his friend take care of his 14-year-old son, Lance, and that he was to be buried at sea. After this, it was pretty clear to authorities that something pretty sketchy had gone on on board the Bluebell, and by November 20th, Terry Jo had recovered enough where she could actually tell the truth about what had happened. According to her, late on November 12th, the Bluebell had begun her return journey to Fort Lauderdale, Florida. At around 9 p.m., 
Terry Jo had entered the lower cabin to go to sleep, leaving her parents, her siblings, Harvey, and his wife up on the deck. But later on, she was woken up suddenly by the sounds of her brother screaming, as well as very heavy footsteps. She decided to bravely investigate, and above deck, she discovered the bodies of both her brother and mother in the main cabin. She walked further onto the deck, where she found Julie and Harvey carrying a bucket. He didn't say anything at first, but struck her and shoved her back below deck, shouting and ordering her to get back down there. Understandably terrified, Terry Jo returned to her cabin, only to start to notice that water and oil was beginning to gush onto the floor around 15 minutes later. Harvey then appeared in her cabin with what appeared to be a rifle in his right hand. He looked at her, but he didn't shoot her. He simply returned above deck. Terry Jo then said she heard hammering sounds. Right after that, she chose to return to the deck and spotted Harvey standing there, as well as the vessel's dinghy floating on the port side of the ship. Harvey asked her, is the dinghy loose? To which she told him that she didn't know. He then told her to hold a rope that was attached to the dinghy while he retrieved something. But by the time Harvey had returned, the rope had slipped through her small fingers. In response to this, Harvey dove overboard and swam toward the dinghy, abandoning Terry Jo on the sinking bluebell. But Terry Jo was resourceful for her age, and she remembered that there was a small oblong cork float that was lashed to the deck. So she untied that as the boat deck began to sink beneath the ocean, and she threw it over the side, before swimming toward it and pushing it further into the open water before climbing aboard. She then spent three and a half days drifting without food, water, or shelter. The float was really small, so small that Terry Jo had to sit upright the whole time, during which she said she repeatedly prayed to be rescued. Fortunately, her prayers were answered when Captain Theo stumbled upon her. Terry Jo insisted that the mast of the Bluebell was intact, and there was not any fire aboard the vessel. The seas were calm throughout the entirety of the events prior to the sinking. Authorities then decided to tell her, that Harvey had been picked up alive three days prior to her, alongside her sister's dead body, and that her parents, her brother, and Harvey's wife had all been lost at sea. Obviously, Harvey's actions, combined with Terry Joe's testimony, suggested strongly that there was foul play afoot, without question. And the following investigation looked into Harvey's recent history. It showed that he, who was also a decorated World War II veteran and a Korean War pilot, actually had a lot of difficulty holding any job for any length of time. As a result, he had serious financial problems and had rather recently arranged a double indemnity insurance policy on the life of his wife. That policy would actually pay double the listed amount if his wife died accidentally. It was also discovered that Harvey actually may have had a long history of insurance fraud. He had previously survived a 1949 car accident that had killed his second wife and her mother when a car he was driving plunged off a bridge at high speed into a bayou on a rainy night. He was able to swim to safety, but he left his wife and her mother behind to drown. Additionally, one of his yawls, the Torbatross, had also previously sunk after running into the submerged wreck of a warship, San Marcos. The crew members had actually warned him to steer clear of this wreckage, but he had repeatedly navigated his vessel around the prohibited site, claiming to his crew's passengers to be attempting to read an inscription upon a buoy marking the site. And another boat he was commanding, the Valiant, a powerboat, had sunk under also suspicious circumstances off the coast of Cuba in 1958. Every single one of these losses had yielded large insurance settlements from which he had financially benefited. So based on this history and the insurance policy he had on his then sixth wife, it was clear that Harvey was looking for another massive payout to fix his financial troubles. While the details of exactly how the murders took place aren't clear, what is suspected is that Harvey probably didn't intend to kill the Dupperalts. He likely just meant to kill his wife and then say she had fallen overboard or something, 
but one of the family must have caught him in the act, and he was left with no choice but to murder them too. As for why he didn't kill Terry Joe, it's still unknown. Obviously, he wasn't around to explain himself. Though, based off of his reaction to her survival, it's generally suspected that he just didn't expect her to survive the sinking, figuring she'd drown at sea, so he didn't bother killing her directly. Either way, it's just a very, very horrifying and sad tale. But Terry Jo would live on. She returned to Green Bay to live with her aunt, her grandmother, and her three cousins, and she actually refused to part with the blouse and slacks she had been wearing at the time of her rescue. A year after the murders, she changed her first name to just Tear, because she was adamant that she not be viewed as a victim and didn't want to be identified as such. Since her name was already associated with the murders, she changed it to try to separate herself from what had happened. Psychological coping strategies were not the way they are now back in the early 60s. Authority figures very seldom spoke with Terry Jo about what had happened, and she was given absolutely zero trauma counseling. She didn't speak publicly about the loss of her family and her survival for over 20 years. Terry Jo did eventually marry, though, and had three children. As an adult, she actually chose to live and work close to the ocean. She's now retired and resides back in Wisconsin. In 2010, Tara Jo Dubberalt Fassbender released her memoir called Alone, Orphaned on the Ocean. The book was co-authored with a psychologist and survival expert, Richard Logan, and it details her family's final cruise, as well as her own life in the years after it. 49 years after her ordeal, she also did give a televised interview with morning television show host Matt Lauer. She would state that she didn't want people to reflect upon her ordeal and say, gee, that poor girl, but rather acknowledge how she's gone on with her life. She said that she always believed that she was saved for a reason, and that if one person heals from a life tragedy, my journey will have been worth it. And with that, a special thank you to all my underwater train finders. Some dude 267, Orange Glass, Benjamin Owens, Panzer Kitson 131-232, Josh Johnson, Metal for Life Guy, Antec A1, Arthur Roy, Tommy Rossini, Lord Captain Von Thrust III, Brian, Jack Carson's Roro Videos, Hayden DeGro, Master of None, Lord Off444, that guy with a beard, Mark Holding, Murder Drone Stall, A Person 723, DM Travel Typhoon, Alfonso Lapuche, Royal Hunter 2860, Iser for 1405, Charles Kwiatkowski, Matthew Wolf, Mr. Sleepy, Matt Weaver, Alaric Jaspers, Tom Red Lion, NS Productions 8104, Hannah Bird, Hendrick Motorsports Fan 5, Wheeljack 8401, Rescues Greyhounds, Dr. Racer 78, The Baxter, and Caleb Crosswhite. Till next time, this is Darkness, and a bit of a fun farewell.